So next, I'd like to introduce Colin Rule. Um, folks, I, I have to tell you all that uh, this man has graciously agreed to speak for us today, and I literally tracked him down through an old law professor of mine, so it really is all who you know. Um, but I'm so excited that he is here with us today. Colin, no pressure, but you now have 182 people watching you on this one. 183. Wow. I know. I have, um, so I my you look great. No, you look great. You look great. All right. So a, a quick introduction. Colin Roll is CEO of Resourceful Internet Solutions, Inc., um, home of Mediate.com, MediateUniversity.com, Arbitrate.com, CaseloadManager.com, and a number of an additional leading online dispute resolution initiatives. From 2017 to 2020, Colin was Vice President for Online Dispute Resolution at Tyler Technologies. Tyler acquired Modria.com, an ODR provider that Colin co-founded in 2017. Previously, mm -hmm. from 2003 to 2011, Colin was Director of Online Dispute Resolution for eBay and PayPal. Further, Colin co-founded Online uh, Resolution in 1999 one of the first online dispute resolution providers and served as its CEO and president. Um, I could go on and on and on. He has a master's degree from Harvard, Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government in Conflict Resolution and Technology, a graduate certificate in dispute resolution from UMass Boston, and a BA from Haverford College. And Colin served in the Peace Corps as a volunteer from 1995 to 1997. This gentleman is amazing. I am so honored to turn this over. Colin, I'm gonna find you on here and make you a co-host just in case you wanna do anything. We're gonna to try to keep everybody else muted. Um, just as a quick uh, housekeeping, if you have a question, please throw it in the chat box. I will happily interrupt Colin um, to make sure that we get your questions answered. And then if you are on here for CLE credit, it does count as your uh, technology requirement for the year. And we will report that to the state bar. If you have called in and are on the phone, you need to email us at DRC mediators. So we know who you are because all it says is call in user number nine. And if you have a uh, handle on your screen that is cjdlw3 we have no idea who you are so you need to email us and let us know who you are or even a first name of dawn we need to know dawn who um, that way we can make sure that everybody receives proper credit okay on that note i'm going to mute myself and turn it over to colin thank you colin Great. thank you so much tara now how much time do i have again uh when do you want me to go to you have 90 minutes 90 so. minutes great excellent Excellent. Very happy to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for the invitation, Tara. Um, I, I have to say, I was amazed watching that video. I, I, I think it's great to see that in North Carolina, you have such um, buy-in from the Chief Justice, from the Administrative Office of the Courts. That's not always the case. So uh, congratulations to the great, uh, for the great work that you're doing. Uh, and it seems like you've got a great foundation moving forward. So my topic today is to talk about online dispute resolution. Um, which is just the use of technology to help people resolve their disputes. So I am going to share some slides. I urge you, please, to interrupt me, to ask questions, to post links in the chat. Um, I am one of the few presenters that, that uh, encourages you to move away from my, uh, my video and open up a browser tab and start exploring some of these websites that we're going to be talking about today. Because there's so much going on in the world of online dispute resolution it's probably going to be more interesting for you to be clicking around and uh, and checking out the resources. Um, yes, is there a question? No worries. If you do have a question, don't no, hesitate don't to interrupt. No, I am no, eager no. to hear it's from everybody. Um, I know, but I don't know what else to do. Button here. Yeah. See if I can get my PowerPoint to come up. You're just the, watching that. Why don't you get it? This. Look, look, why don't you put the computer over here? Not sure if Lynn wants us to be hearing everything he's talking about. So let's see if I have the power to mute him. Oh, there we go. All right. So uh, Tara, are you seeing a screen that says online dispute resolution state of the art? Thumbs up. Okay. Yes, I agree. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive in and just start sharing uh, some of my slides. I'm going to break every couple minutes or so, every couple slides, and see if people have any questions or thoughts or reactions. But I am eager to steer this presentation in the direction that is of most interest to all of you. Now. 
I'm going to show you uh, a, a system that we built um, for resolving family disputes. But there are so many different implementations of ODR up right now. I am happy to open up a browser and we can take a look at, at some of the live systems uh, in a different area if that's where we want it to go. But let me just make sure, let me level set. As I mentioned before, online dispute resolution, or we call it ODR, is the use of information and communications technology to help people resolve their disputes. Now, this is the way we defined ODR 20 years ago when it first started uh, really growing. And I think this definition is getting a little long in the tooth. Um, what we've seen now is people talk about using information and communications technology not only to resolve disputes, but also to prevent disputes and to manage conflict that is not that easily resolved. So we're expanding the definition on the back end, but we're also expanding the definition on the front end because this notion of information and communications technology, a lot of people think that just means the internet. And obviously the internet is a very powerful information and communications technology, but there's others as well. Uh, you know, one of the ones that we often overlook is the telephone. And we've been using telephone for mediations for decades. And there are plenty of studies that show the telephone mediation can be equivalently uh, successful in terms of resolution rates. So we need to not only think about what technologies we have at our disposal today, but also what technologies have existed for a while that we're utilizing, and also what technologies may be coming in the future. Now, the National Center for State Courts has done a lot of work on ODR, and I do urge you to check out their website, ncsc.org slash ODR. And I've been involved with a bunch of the working groups that NCSC has convened talking about ODR. And that definition I shared with you, I think is a little overbroad for many of the folks at NCSC. They have defined ODR as, quote, a public facing digital space in which parties can convene to resolve their dispute or case. And I think there's a pretty good definition um, of one piece of ODR. Obviously, if we open up a WebEx room or we open up a Zoom room, and everybody comes together and then we can all talk it out and find a solution by mutual agreement or if we can't resolve it by mutual agreement we can bring in an evaluator to listen to the parties and render a decision well that's that fits this definition a public facing digital space like an online workroom but one of the things this definition overlooks is the ability for technology to play a role in even evaluating cases and this is when we start to talk about artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, technology can play a role in enforcing outcomes. That's when we talk about things like blockchain and smart contracts. So this definition is good, again, for where we are now. And if you look at what a lot of courts are doing around the country, I think this definition is, is adequate. But when you think about where things are going, and if you look at some of the experiments that are happening, I think this definition may end up being too narrow. So I am, we're currently uh, writing an article at uh, odr.info which I also urge you to check out, the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, which is based at uh, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, we're writing an article talking about what, you know, what's a better definition of ODR moving forward. And I think there's kind of a spectrum uh, of all ODR approaches, the degree to which technology is playing more of an active role in the dispute, or if it's just convening a space for parties to come together and communicate. So stay tuned, I think there's more happening on the definition side. Um, but really, ODR, the reason why we picked that name, and I remember uh, being in a, an online uh, discussion forum as part of ADR Cyber Week. ADR Cyber Week is our annual conference talking about online dispute resolution. I think this year is our 26th edition of ADR Cyber Week, maybe the 23rd. Um, and uh, we have presenters from all over the world, hundreds of people, academics, practitioners, come together and talk about ODR. But what, at one of the earlier ones, I think it was 1998, we had a discussion about what are we gonna call this? And we decided to call it ODR. Now my wife jokes, odor, really? That's the best you could have come up with for calling the field? Sounds like, you know, bad perfume. And I said, well, no, no, I mean, we wanted to emphasize that ODR and ADR are related. Um, and by choosing ODR, people said, okay, well, this is just a step away from ADR. So I used to say ODR is ADR plus technology. But one of the things we say in the ODR field is there's no A in ODR. 
And the A, at least back in the day, it stood for alternative dispute resolution. Well, an alternative to what? Well, the courts. So, uh, but in ODR, we, we're not an alternative. And if you look at many of the dispute types that ODR is being used for, the courts really are not a viable option for those disputes. So we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but I think what I wanna emphasize is the key components of ODR are very similar to the key components of ADR. You know, we do negotiation, we do mediation, we do arbitration, we have MEDARB, we have evaluative mediation, we have facilitative mediation. All of those things exist in ODR as well. And when we first started building ODR, we thought we would just take ADR processes and then transfer them online. I was originally trained, thank you Tara for that incredibly gracious introduction. Uh, but one of the things you mentioned was Haverford College, which is where I went for my undergrad degree. And that Haverford College for many years was a Quaker school. And I was originally trained in mediation by the Quakers. They came out and did a, a weekend mediation training. And the model that they taught me for mediation initially was an uninterrupted storytelling and then assisted storytelling and then a joint problem solving sort of um, process for mediation. So the first online dispute resolution website I built uh, in the late 90s, I did exactly that. I did uninterrupted storytelling, um, assisted storytelling and then joint problem solving. And I just built it into a website. It wasn't technologically very sophisticated. Now remember, this is back before we had iPhones, before we had Facebook, before we had Zoom, before we had Skype. So. We just used the tools at our disposal at the time. But what we started to realize as we experimented with technology and dispute resolution was actually technology opens up very interesting new possibilities for how you can resolve disputes. Things that would be, if not impossible, at least highly impractical in the face-to-face -face world. And we can talk about some of those things. One, one of those things is crowdsourced dispute resolution. And we can talk about this when I was at eBay, we started something called the community court. And if you had a dispute with another user on eBay, you could come into the community court, you could lay out the, your disagreement, each side makes their arguments, and then it goes in front of a jury of eBay members who have been tested to, have, to they don't know the two people in the dispute, they've never transacted with them. They evaluate the information, all the jurors vote, and whoever wins the majority of the jury wins the case and eBay enforces the outcome. Well, the thing is, the average value of these disputes was about 75 bucks. And I had so many people that wanted to be jurors, I would put 100 people, I'd put 200 people on one of these cases because software is administering the whole process. So there's really no cost to bring in 200 people to evaluate a $75 dispute. And the outcome that's generated by a jury that large is in, has high credibility because it's not like you're dealing with you know, bias you know, five or six people out of a 200 person jury are biased in favor of the buyer or biased in favor of the seller. Well, they're going to get washed out by all the other people. And we could test all those jurors to ensure who was doing a good job, who was actually reading all of the information and who was deciding decisions that agreed with the, the rest of their fellow jurors the most of the time. So that's just an example of something you'd never be able to do that in person. I mean, how could you get 200 people to drive down to an office and listen to a dispute over 75 bucks, evaluate that information and render a decision? So there are many other examples of how technology opens new possibilities in dispute resolution. Another one is problem diagnosis. And problem diagnosis, there is a little bit of literature in the face-to-face -face dispute resolution field about pre-negotiation. And, and I've done a lot of work in multi-party complex disputes like energy disputes, environmental disputes. And there's a lot of conflict and situation assessment work that you do in that field before you ever convene everybody together in a joint session. So there's a little bit of theory about that. But the thing that's very interesting about technology is you get access to these disputes much, much earlier in their life cycle. Uh, and I've had situations where the complainant has notified me as an online dispute resolution service provider about their concern before they even notify the respondent. So as a face-to-face -face mediator, and I've mediated lots of face-to-face -face disputes, I get access to the disputes after the parties have already been negotiating against each other. They've already made offers, they've already hit an impasse, there's been some frustration that built up and that's what motivated them to reach out to a, to a dispute resolution service provider. In online circumstances, I often will talk with the parties before they've even begun their negotiation. And that can be incredibly helpful 
in setting expectations, fleshing out BATNAs, their best alternative to a negotiated agreement, understanding the ZOPA, the zone of potential agreement. Um, and there's a lot of education that needs to happen with parties early on. And people trust technology. And there's a concept we have in ODR called the fourth party, where technology has a seat at the table alongside the third party, mediator or arbitrator. So there's a lot of ways that technology can bring in information to educate disputants prior to them engaging in a negotiation that can set reasonable expectations or set a frame around what uh, the negotiation is really dealing with and getting clarity on the problem. So we can talk about problem diagnosis, but also direct negotiation when two parties are communicating directly to reach an agreement. There are some times when these negotiations run off the rails because maybe parties engage in threats and insult, insults. There may be misrepresentation. Um, you know, I think many of us have been in negotiations where there's an agreement that a payment is going to be made, but just the discussion about what that payment will be, it will go on and on and on. And I've had mediations where I'm like, please, I will pay the $20 difference between your two positions. You know, what is it that's creating that impasse? Um, but there's a lot of ways technology can structure negotiation. And I can give you some examples as to how that works. Um, uh, lessons we've learned in resolving hundreds of millions of disputes and ways that technology, because really mediation is just assisted negotiation. And there are ways that technology can assist in negotiation as well. Now, when you get into mediation where you have a human mediator, technology can provide important new capabilities for mediators. Um, you can have asynchronous communication with your parties, text-based communication. You can have a caucus with your parties at the same time you're having a joint session because uh, you're, you're engaging in text-based communication. So you can caucus with your parties even when the conversation's going well and headed in the right direction. So there's a lot of interesting capabilities there. And then the last point, you note I didn't say arbitration, I said evaluation. Because many of the evaluative dispute resolution processes that are out there in ODR, they're not arbitrations enforceable under law and conducted, obviously, in the shadow of the law. They could be, um, like we did at eBay, tens of millions of um, privately evaluated cases where a customer service rep decides the outcome and enforces the outcome. And in the vast majority of cases, the parties are, are happy with that. Even though they have the ability to appeal it in a, in a court, they never do because the value of the case is so low. So I think what you'll see is all of you who are dispute resolution experts, none of these concepts are that new. But when you take technology and you add them in, there are some important tools that that puts into the mediator and the dispute system designers toolbox that increase flexibility and capability. So let me just show a couple more slides and I'll stop and we'll see what kind of questions people have. As Tara said, I was the first director of online dispute resolution at eBay and then at PayPal. Actually, eBay, when I joined, owned PayPal. Now they've sep separated again. But we, we built something called the Resolution Center. And the Resolution Center still operates at eBay and operates at PayPal. And, um, you know, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So I'm very happy when I see Resolution Centers now exist at many other websites, like um, Airbnb has a Resolution Center and Upwork has a Resolution Center. Pretty much any online scalable marketplace or collaborative shareable economy uh, website, they have disputes that arise and they need to have a fast and fair way to resolve those disputes. So eBay was the first website that really tackled this and we built a console that every user had. They could come in and report a problem, walk through the resolution process. We got to the point where we were resolving about 60 million disputes per year and 50% of those were resolved amicably between the buyer and the seller. They, 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 they worked it out with the assistance of our software. And 90% of those cases were resolved in software only, meaning no human from eBay had to touch the case. The only humans involved were the disputants. And we can talk more about some of the lessons learned at eBay. I wrote a book for the American Bar Association sort of distilling a lot of the lessons because we, as I mentioned, we resolved hundreds of millions of disputes through eBay. And again, this was a decade ago. So now that volume, that sounds pretty big because that's, that's actually bigger than the US court system, civil court system. Um, but uh, Amazon does way more dispute resolution than we ever did at eBay now. They think about it differently than we think about it. 
But now Alibaba and Taobao in China, they built their own ODR system and they're doing way more disputes than Amazon. So we're talking about billions of disputes being resolved every year through the use of tools like this. And when I say there's no A in ODR, the courts really can't resolve these disputes well because they're low value, they're high volume, they're cross-border, so the jurisdiction is very confused. You know, I had disputes on eBay where the buyer was in France, the seller was in Argentina, we, the marketplace, was based in the United States, and our terms and conditions essentially specified California law, but the items were being shipped out of Hong Kong. So what law applies in that case? Um, how, how would you even, if you're the buyer and you have a dispute and you're in France, do you file a case in France? And why would the seller in Argentina care that a case has been filed in France? Do you file a case in Argentina? Well, are you gonna find a lawyer to represent you for a $75 case? No, we have to build a new system, a new justice system in essence, that works the way the internet works. And that's essentially what ODR has become. The other thing is these are not pre-dispute binding dispute resolution processes. Any of our users anywhere in the world could appeal the outcome from this process in a court. We don't block them from doing that. Although we did have pre-dispute binding arbitration clauses in our agreements, but that's only for disputes against eBay and against PayPal. Um, but what we found is 99.999% of these cases never made it into a court because our process was designed in a transparent, easily accessible way, and it was 100% enforcement because if eBay decided that the buyer was entitled to a refund, they controlled PayPal. So they could take the money from the seller and they could give it to the buyer. So uh, essentially what we were doing, we had about 250 million users at eBay. And if you counted those up as citizens, we would have been the eighth largest country in the world. So I, we were building a civil justice system for that virtual country in a sense. And again, that number sounds big, but if you look at Facebook with their 1.6 or 1.7 billion users, I mean, eBay, eBay is starting to look kind of small at this point. And we need resolution systems for all of these online interactions. So we can spend more time talking about e-commerce, but what we realized at eBay, and again, I, I'm a longtime dispute resolution guy. I never thought I would be in Silicon Valley, um, but I wrote a book on online dispute resolution called ODR for Business, and eBay called me up and said, hey, we need you. So that was how I ended up out here. But there's a lot of need for dispute resolution that goes beyond e-commerce. And I'll stop after this slide and then open it up for some questions. But um, what we realized was that same tool, that resolution center, could be useful for other kinds of disputes outside of the walled garden of eBay. So we spun out that technology and we created a company called Modria and we started building online dispute resolution systems in other areas, not only for other e-commerce sites, because obviously if you have a dispute with someone um, you know, that you met on Thumbtack or that you, you know, had build you a website on Upwork, you need to resolve that. But also consumer disputes offline. They have the resolutions and oftentimes the consumers prefer to resolve those through technology as well. But then we got pulled into insurance. Um, our, our software runs the largest case volume for the American Arbitration Association, the New York No Fault Insurance Caseload, which deals with medical insurance reimbursement claims in the wake of motor vehicle accidents. So I can talk to you about that. Uh, we looked at product liability, like pharmaceutical companies where people have adverse drug reactions. A huge area for us ended up being public disputes like property tax assessment appeals. Uh, we built many systems. We, we, uh, we do all of the online property tax assessment appeals in New Orleans and Nashville and Gainesville, Florida and um, Mecklenburg, Virginia and the state of Ohio, the Board of Tax Appeals. So there's a lot of need for technology to resolve those cases. But eventually what happened was um, the company, Modria, we got pulled into um, uh, Tyler Technologies, which is the number one provider of court technology in the U.S. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what happened when ODR was pulled into the Tyler platform. But again, I, I think the applicability of ODR Pretty much any place you see dispute resolution, now you're starting to see ODR. When I first started to do ODR, I had a policy, no family disputes. I just didn't feel like it was a good fit. I thought it was better for low dollar value disputes between strangers where they would never get together face to face. So family just did not seem like a good fit to me in 2000. And now ODR and family is the hottest area. We see ODR 
online websites for getting divorces and you know having the quote unquote good divorce and we're going to talk about that i'm going to show you some examples so the culture is changing the technology is changing expectations of citizens are changing and the younger generation is open to technology in a way that the older generation maybe will never understand and that's why they they want there to be online channels for resolving these disputes and that and they're working hard to create them so let me stop there for a minute let me stop my sharing and let's see i saw a couple questions come in on the chat uh tara anything that you think i, sh I should focus on and so yeah i like the question asking if you are familiar with airbnb dispute resolution process and how would you characterize it yeah and that's a great question um i i did a lot of work with airbnb in the early days um, um and they didn't have any dispute resolution process. And there was a really bad situation that happened when they were only about 60, 70 people. And I went up to San Francisco, I met with the team. It was a woman who had rented out, she had an apartment in a building in San Francisco, but, and she hadn't rented out her apartment. She had rented out another unit that she owned, which neighbored her unit in the apartment building. And um, the people that rented it ended up trashing the place. And they actually ended up punching through the drywall in the wall and then getting into her apartment and wreaking havoc. And she filed a complaint with Airbnb and Airbnb didn't have a dispute resolution process at the time. So their response to her was kind of, sorry that this happened to you, you know, maybe next time, you know, you know, I don't know, reinforce your walls. I mean, it was, it was not a good response. And this woman was very upset and started to go on a social media campaign, kind of trashing Airbnb. And this was at a very delicate time in its growth. They were just getting going. Most people didn't know about Airbnb. So one of their investors um, who had worked with me at PayPal called me up there and I met with them. And I said, look, you got to get this right. People need to know when they engage in a service like this, there's some vulnerability associated with bringing a stranger into your house. They have to know that you've got their back. You need to have protection programs. You need to have a dispute resolution program. So it took them a while to start their resolution center. But they actually ended up doing a really good job. And uh, I, I think that their, their program is pretty good. Now, obviously, eBay, if somebody sends you a sweater and you don't like it, that's different than if you have someone in your guest room and they're, being, they're behaving erratically and you feel for your safety. Um, or if you land in the airport and you take a taxi over to your Airbnb and you look at the place and you go, I'm not going in there. I'm, this is too scary for me. These are different kinds of disputes. So it's not a buyer-seller dispute, it's a host-guest dispute. Um, but I think that Airbnb, they started to take that seriously. They actually ended up hiring some of my colleagues from eBay to set up what they... I've lost Colin. Did everybody else lose him? Yes. Yes. All right. Hang on. Let's see if we can get him back. Needs one of those Wi-Fi spreaders that I was watching earlier this oh, morning. Oh, hey, you need to sell him one. All right, Colin, we got you back. All we right, lost sorry you. about that. A little, little internet, internet hiccup there, as the case may be. But, um, but yeah. So, so Anne, um, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. It looks like you had your own dispute. I would love to hear what what was the nature of your issue, if you'd be willing to share. Well, it, it's a long story, but uh, the short version is we rented a houseboat in Hong Kong and wow. the advertising online of the houseboat was of the boat next door instead of the one we stayed on. And it was without water for a couple of days. So, uh, but we had a good time. <laughs> well, that's good. You made lemonade out of the lemons, but did they end up giving you a refund? They did, but they, I, I really liked the process because they, you know, allowed you to engage in negotiations with the owner and um, it ended up working out, but I could have never resolved it without that. Because, I mean, why would he care? Like you said, why would the owner exactly. of the boat care? But he had to care about Airbnb because he wanted to continue to um, rent. That's exactly right. And that's what we found with eBay as well. You know, eBay was kind of the, the, the mama you know, maybe the teacher at recess kind of overlooking everybody. So they might, the, the seller might think that they could stick it to one of their buyers and get away with it. But if eBay found that out, well, then eBay would demote their search results uh, in listings. Um, eBay could charge them higher prices. 
eBay could require them to submit more information when they sold an item, like uh, provide tracking and insurance and things like that. So the sellers would listen to eBay. And that's what the dispute, that's what the resolution center did. It created accountability. Um, and when I, again, when I talk about um, online dispute resolution and trust online, one of the things we did a lot of work at, at eBay, as I said, my division at eBay was called trust and safety. And trust is kind of a, kind of a complicated concept. Um, you know, sometimes people trust websites that they shouldn't trust. Facebook, just note that down. You should not trust Facebook. Um, if, if, if you're not paying anything, uh, you know, it's like a poker game where you look around the table. Who's the mark? If you don't know who the mark is, it's you. On Facebook, you are the product. So I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole because they made a lot of dispute resolution ODR mistakes at Facebook. But then there are other websites that should be trusted that are not trusted. And I think about some payment platforms, too, that have done great work on ensuring that the system is completely impenetrable by bad guys, but the users don't know that, and it's got a bad reputation. So uh, what we said at eBay is there are three legs to the online trust stool, one of which is what we called FIT, fraud investigations, the fraud investigations team, and that's getting the bad guys, because you don't want to set up negotiations between criminals and their victims, and there are bad guys out there. Um, but when you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of transactions, it's less than one tenth of one percent of the transactions are bad guys. But you got to find those bad guys and you got to get them off the system quickly. The second leg is reputation. And that means you need to have transparency around people's performance online. You need to track their identity so they can't just take advantage of a bunch of people, close their account and open a new account. And then it's you know blank slate and they can keep taking advantage of people. So reputation systems like we have at eBay, like the feedback system or you look at Yelp, or you look at TripAdvisor, or some of these reputation systems. And the last leg is ODR, fast and fair resolution to any problems that arise, transparent, consistent. You know, we found those were the three legs to the trust stool. And if you can get all three of those legs right, you have a competitive advantage over other websites. And that's why, for instance, 53 cents of every dollar spent on e-commerce in the United States goes to Amazon because that was one of the things they prioritized right up front. If you buy something and you're not happy, we're going to get it solved for you quickly and fairly, even to the disadvantage of Amazon. I've had circumstances. I bought a bunch of DVDs. I think it was Friday Night Lights season one years ago, and I bought it on Amazon, and it never showed up. And I said, hey, you know, this never showed up. They said, no problem. We'll ship you another one. And three days later, I got two copies of the DVDs in the mail. Now, Amazon knew that they sent those DVDs to me, but they didn't fight with me. They just sent me another set. And I called them up and I said, hey, I got two sets. They said, don't worry about it, keep them. And the reason why they did that was because they have a loyal customer in me. I buy a ton of stuff on Amazon and they know that it's, their, it's worth their while to do that. And I think people have learned over time, wow, you know, if you were to tell me in 2005 that we were gonna be buying our toothbrushes on, on the internet, I would have thought you were nuts. I mean, it's so much easier to go down to the drugstore and buy it, who's gonna pay for shipping? Who's gonna deal with returns? But Amazon figured it out, you know, they can in, here in Silicon Valley, they'll get you something you buy within an hour. And with Prime, it's free, free delivery. So again, this is where we are today. The question is, where are we going? And I think these kinds of systems, think about the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has accelerated these trends unimaginably. I have a friend who says to me, Colin, uh, COVID-19 has done more to mo market ODR in the last year than you have in the last 20 years. And that's absolutely true. You know, I had mediators, very experienced top mediators in the field who would say to me, you got to do this face to face. You cannot do it online. You have to look in the other side's eyes. You have to shake hands. And I'm never going to do this via video conference. It's fine. That's fine. And now they're calling me up. So how do I change my Zoom background? And how can I get my filing form working on my website? And some of these people are saying to me, I prefer online now. I prefer online because it lets me have many more conversations with my parties, lets me share documents, we can e-sign things right online. You know, there's a lot to argue for it. And I think even if we get to a post-COVID world where it's not an issue and infection rates are down in the single digits, I think still 50% of our mediations are going to happen online because this channel of video communication has been so normalized. And it's not even going to be the mediators who are pushing for it. I think it's going to be the parties because the preference numbers are off the charts for online interaction. 
with mediators, online interaction with the courts. It's just the way we live our lives now. So, okay, I know, Ann, you, you asked me a narrow question, and I went off on a disquisition there. Any other questions we should tackle, Tara, before I dive back? Yes, Keith Peter Meredith has her hand up, which I love. Oh, great. So I'm going to let her go ahead and unmute herself and uh, ask her a question. Please. Hi there. Well, I actually was going to say one, one short anecdote after Ann gave her story. The last time I stayed in an Airbnb in New York City, person when we got to the apartment they weren't it wasn't permissible for them to utilize airbnb they had all these really detailed instructions about how we were supposed to pretend that we were their family members and i was there with my brother and so every time we would be in the hall we had this like whole backstory of like when did you last see bubba i was it, it was just very funny but anyway because we were trying to sort of fly with, with, with what they did but um i had a question that i put in the chat i was wondering if anyone um is parlaying this awesome um platform expanding it um in a socially conscious way um to for, for example for, for people that a pro bono work um you know a lot of times those cases are low value and um and uh high volume and and anyway just Absolutely. was curious if anybody's expanding it in that way yeah, you know, it's interesting as I segue into some of the stuff I did with Tyler, a lot of who I was working with were legal service bureaus. And um, I, I, I like working with courts, but I think the courts think about what they do in a very specific way. I know we have a lot of probably judges and court administrators on the call. The thing that I like about legal, legal service people is they, are, they think very creatively about, okay, we have a limited budget. We have all these people that we want to service. What's a way that we can provide maximum benefit to as many people as possible? So some of the ODR systems that I like the most that we built, we did in conjunction with legal service organizations. Uh, you know, legal service organizations, I think my understanding is in the U.S., turn away 60, 70 percent of the people that come to them asking for help because they just don't have resources. And it's not that those people don't deserve the help or they don't have cases that merit the help. It's just underfinanced. And I think being able to build websites and kind of create robots that can deliver services, that's a way to really magnify the impact of your dollar. And I think legal service bureaus really think creatively in a future-oriented way about how can we address the need. So, Kate, I, is, do, you, do you work with an organization like that? Uh, well, I've locked two days of my mediation schedule to conduct pro, pro bono work. Um, so I just encounter this kind of thing a lot. But I think the numbers of attorneys in North Carolina, the percentage of people um, who who conduct pro bono work could could be higher. Sure. Um, it would be neat if there was a way to. Um, there are legitimate reasons for that for for, for many folks, but um, there was a way to funnel or refer people to an existing, um, you know, for landlord tenant issues and you know, there's so many. Um, so many things. So that that's what sparked my as you're describing it. Well, yeah, um, percent. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is we have a bit of a supply and demand problem in the U.S. around dispute resolution because we have a lot of mediators in certain states, and we have certain states that have no mediators. So at Mediate.com, we have something like six or seven states where there are no mediators that have registered with us in those states. Well, it doesn't mean there aren't disputes in those states. And I have mediators in other areas, particularly around graduate programs in dispute resolution, you know, all the alumni there. They're like, well, I, can't, I can't find cases. It's really hard for me to find cases. Well, great. So provide services online and let's hook you up in South Dakota because there's no reason why a mediator can't provide advice in a family dispute. You're not providing legal advice, so you don't have the same issue about it can only happen within each individual state. So again, I think technology opens up great possibilities. And um, I found mediators that say to me, look, when I'm doing face-to-face -face cases, I don't like to do more than two or three at a time. But when I'm doing online cases, I can do six or seven at a time. You know, and especially if there there are these kind of pro bono lower value cases, maybe even more than that. Um, I've I've known some mediators that have been able to do ten or fifteen at a time. So it does create opportunities for us. But again, we need to think creatively about uh, sort of where all this is going, so that we're building our business where the highway is going instead of building it where the highway is today. I, I think there was one other question from from Deborah. Did you raise your hand? Kid Colin, we met way back in Sturbridge. I was the mediator who was doing Sturbridge, conflicts right. between people about animals. 
So I, I remember I love, that. Yeah. <laughs> remember? Um, and it's, it's been um, a slow slog because people who are, um, fighting over animals want to sue. Uh, that's the only advice they get from their attorneys. Um, right. But we're trying, especially now with COVID um, and the huge um, amount of animals that have been purchased and the veterinarians um, not being able to keep up and high suicide rates, to bring that to the veterinarians. What would be your thoughts doing an eBay type or um, a, a Airbnb type um, yeah. resolution program. I'm working with Scott Maloof and um, Jeremy Cohn to build something that is ODR, that we go in and it. really try to build for veterinarians um, that process. The veterinarians want it, but the um, malpractice attorneys uh, don't want it at all uh, because they don't want veterinarians to speak to the client when they can nip it in the bud. So I'd right. love your thoughts on that because we talked about this way back when. I'm still rowing that boat, Colin, and um, I'll try it. to catch I love it. And uh, it's, as, as, as the acquirer of a shelter uh, COVID puppy during the pandemic, I know there can be issues that emerge. Uh, you know, I, I, I will say also, Deborah, one of the things that's happened since we last talked is when I was at Modria, we built a dispute resolution process for Rover.com, which is one of the top websites for pet sitting and pet walking. And, you know, people are emotional about these disputes. These are their babies. They're their furry babies. And, you know, so sometimes people will behave if, if they suspect that while they were on a trip, their pet was mistreated or if they come back and their pet has an injury because it was mixed with other dogs and they didn't know those dogs, people can get very, very upset. And it's very important to have a resolution process. You know, uh, one of my heroes is Frank Sander, who is the, the guy who coined the idea of the multi-door courthouse, a uh, Harvard law professor. But he wrote an article that talked about fitting the forum to the fuss. And this was a pretty radical concept back in the 70s when he first proposed this. But you can't just build one dispute resolution process and put every dispute into it. And I think the courts have learned that lesson. Now we have family courts, we have landlord-tenant courts, we have small claims courts. But I think pet disputes are a good example. You know, the, a traditional litigation orientation is not always the best way to deal with these very emotional, personal cases. And I think uh, that was what we found at Rover. People needed to communicate. And, uh, you know, Rover, again, was sort of the eBay in that circumstance. They had an enforcement ability. Um, you know, the, the pet sitters and pet walkers had an incentive to take care of their customers because they know that Rover was watching and Rover was evaluating their efficacy. But, but the issues that you're talking about, um, I think I'd love to brainstorm with you further about that, how we could use some of this technology to build a centralized location where a lot of these cases may be referred in by vets or referred in, by, in, other, in other directions. Um, I think that would be a really exciting application. As I say- Thanks so much. Yeah, any ADR. But the other thing that you mentioned, and we should come back to this, I think this is a rich topic, is um, you know sometimes lawyers feel very threatened by this. And I've done presentations to bar associations where pe people in the audience have stood up to, at the mic after I gave a very similar presentation and essentially said, over my dead body, you know, my grandfather practiced law this way, you know, my father practiced law this way, I practiced law this way. No, I'm not going to move this online. You know, it's not going to happen. Now, and that's, and I used to get the UPL letters from the bar associations, the unauthorized practice of law letters, but things are changing a lot now. And just like the video that Tara just played, you know, the buy-in from the Chief Justice, that's is so encouraging about uh, the importance of dispute resolution. Now we're getting that for ODR. And we have Chief Justices and we have presidents of bar associations. The ABA has come out as a huge force behind uh, promoting ODR as a way to expand access to justice. As I say, the National Center for State Courts has come out with reports and guidebooks for courts as to how to utilize ODR. So I, I think that there is an acknowledgement that we can do better. We can do better in the justice system. We can do better in legal services. And technology is going to be a tool in the toolbox for us to do that. So we need to be creative. And especially out here in the West, you see a lot of the um, legal practice rules being relaxed, where now they're creating kind of legal practitioners. So, you know, if you have, a, you don't have to be admitted to the bar to handle low level civil cases. You know, they're deputizing people to um, help out uh, folks in landlord tenant cases or in divorce cases or small claims cases. And obviously you still need to have, uh, you still need to be admitted to the bar to do, you know, a criminal case. But this notion of legal practitioners and legal sandboxes where 
some of these legal services could be delivered through technology. I think, I think there's some exciting possibilities here. So, so maybe we can revisit that too. I mean, my message to lawyers is don't be afraid of this. If you embrace it, there's enormous opportunity. But if you insist on doing things the way they've always been done, then slowly but surely you're going to be out of sync with the time. So we, we can come back to that, I think, at the end. Um, well, and we've got one more hand up by Donna Wright. Sure, let's do it. Donna, hit me. Donna, I have unmuted you. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here, but I didn't know my hand was up. I'm sorry. No worries. I'm, Donna. We're gonna I don't even know how to you. do that. <laughs> I'll put it down for you. There you Thank go. You. I lowered your hand. <laughs> No worries. Okay, let me just show a couple more slides and then let's open it up because I'm enjoying this Q&A so much. Um, I just want to put a little meat on the bones here to, um, to say, let's, all right, Jeffrey, I like your uh, Django slide, but we're going to go back to mine. Okay, so we talked about ODR beyond e-commerce. As I mentioned, ODR is getting a lot of traction in the courts. And I know, Tara, you and I have gone back and forth about kind of what's happening in North Carolina. Um, I, I think uh, we have about 80 courts in the U.S. now that have launched ODR. In places like California, it's very county by county. Each county is its own world. Other places like New Mexico and Utah, it's very statewide. Um, uh, I'm going to show you an example from Nevada. Again, the vast majority of the population in Nevada is around Las Vegas. So whatever Clark County does, you know, that, that's sort of the bulk of Nevada. But we've seen some courts build their own systems, like Utah and Connecticut. We've seen um, other providers, like Matterhorn, um, has really gotten an enormous amount of traction around the country building ODR systems. They focused mainly on, the, like, traffic cases initially, but now they've moved into other areas. Um, you know, my platform, Modria, we were integrated into Tyler, and Tyler has launched big uh, initiatives, uh, places like Los Angeles, which is the biggest court in the U.S. Um, but it's exciting to see the progress and the experimentation. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with the ABA and the National Center for State Courts, and particularly the Pew Charitable Trust. They announced they were going to spend $250 million to promote access to justice using technology. And they chose two initiatives. One was ODR. And one is what they call litigant portals, which are kind of websites where, um, you know, citizens can log in and sort of navigate where they should go in order to find resolution. But um, I think a lot of courts signed up for ODR because they wanted to get some of that Pew money. Uh, none of that money came to us as a service provider. It all went to the courts. It, they also are funding academic studies of ODR uh, to, to make sure that not only are the outcomes that are being generated out of these ODR processes, you know, are the parties that participate in them satisfied, but also are they durable? Do they last as long as face-to-face -face resolutions? So there's a lot that's happening here to promote court-connected ODR, which is exciting. But I think everybody has their, own, their hands on a different part of the elephant, so I'm not sure everybody's kind of on the same page. Um, I will also say, and we could spend a whole, you know, we could do the whole thing talking about what's going on around the world, it's amazing how much is happening in terms of integrating ODR into the courts globally. And again, places like the European Union and India, they're building whole new justice systems, sort of additive to their court system for e-commerce, cross-border e-commerce purchases. Obviously, in the European Union, a lot of purchases cross borders, from Germany to Italy or from Spain to Finland. Um, but then India, you know, the average time from filing a civil case towards here, having that case decided is about 13 years in India. And that's even for low dollar value civil cases. Uh, so India is now creating an, an ODR system for their digital payments volume. And India has already been banning certain paper currencies to force the move to digital payments. So they're gonna have almost a shadow justice system only for these digital payment disputes. But because all the payments are moving towards digital, that's gonna be really their consumer dispute resolution process. So it's very exciting to see what's happening in India. But then um, uh, British Columbia has something called the Civil Resolution Tribunal. I urge you to take a look. If you, if you have a browser tab up, you just type in BCCRT and it'll come up and you can see it's an all online court. They deal with a wide variety of different case types. They deal with what they call strata disputes, which are really like condo association disputes. They do motor vehicle claims, but you never have to show up in person. You never have to file a piece of paper and they go all the way through to the adjudication. So the entire court operates online and more and more cases are being shifted to the CRT. 
doing a great job. And I think the UK has also been inspired by the British Columbia example, and they're launching a bunch of different uh, ODR platforms under the umbrella of what they call Her Majesty's Online Court. So you never have to show up in person. Their civil claims less than 25,000 pounds, and it's a streamlined online process. Uh, also, international organizations are pushing ODR very hard. I was part of the UNCITRAL, which is the UN Not agency. What the, what the value is um, and who's going to get it. And then the other schedules about visible property and debts and unequal and all of that. But yes, you do asset buy. Uh -huh. I think that was something else. Um, but uh, I was like, wow, this is a very in-depth question all of a sudden. Um, but I'll just make the point that APEC, which is the um, treaty organization of all the countries that ring the Pacific, they've just released an ODR framework um, uh, for small and medium-sized business disputes cross-border. Uh, the ISO, the International Standards Organization, has a big initiative to create standards for cross-border resolutions. And, you know, we see country by country, Brazil just made uh, mediation mandatory in all civil cases. And the law that they wrote says you can do the mediation online. So there's an organization, odrlatinoamerica.com, which is promoting ODR in Latin America. There's an organization, odrafrica.com, promoting ODR in Africa. Um, I had calls this week with Latvia and with Ukraine. They're launching ODR frameworks for dealing with their civil case volumes. Um, and I had another call last week with the Japan Online Dispute Resolution Association. So, again, I think the pandemic has accelerated this enormously. I always thought it was going to just happen organically over time. But because we were all forced, all the, all the plane flights shut down and, uh, you know, it was very hard to cross borders, the Internet made it possible for us to do that. And that's really made ODR a top priority. So, um, I'm tempted to stop and see if there are more questions, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to power through and give you the example of the platform and then I'll stop and then we can uh, have some more Q&A. So let me just explain how courts, court ODR works with Modria. Uh, now imagine, so the courts oftentimes are reluctant to fund dispute resolution services that exist outside of the court resolution process. Because if you were to set up an ODR system and just make it publicly available, we could be resolving disputes left and right, but that doesn't necessarily benefit the court volume. So the way Modria works actually is it works after the case is filed into the court. And we can talk about the wisdom of that. But in essence, if there is a dispute that's resolvable between the parties in a particular case type, we can open up a Modria room. And if a settlement is reached in that room, well, then you can just cancel the hearing. And then the settlement agreement is automatically generated and filed into the case and certified by the court. Now, if you can't reach an agreement in the ODR process, well, that's fine. It just proceeds to the hearing. And the beauty of that is, you know, this is the average timeline for most courts, something like this, where the case is filed, the answer is filed, the hearing date is set, and then there's a waiting period, usually about three months, before the hearing is held, and then there's a pr 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 proposed order and then a final order. So essentially what we do with Modria is we create when the case is filed we open up a room and we customize that room around the particular type of case so the parties can come in they can negotiate with each other assisted by technology if they want they can invite in a mediator and if they can't get a resolution well that's fine they go to the hearing and there's no extension in the timeline because the odr process always takes less than the waiting period for the hearing so and if the parties decide they don't want to do it that's fine they can opt out they just go to the hearing at any point you can say you know what this isn't working for me, cancel, we'll go to the hearing. But what if you can get a resolution, well, the beauty of that is you don't need the rest of the process. You know, that saves a lot of time for the courts and, which is money, of course, and it increases the satisfaction of the parties because they come in and have the conversation. We already know that 98% of civil cases get resolved before they go to trial. Um, and I think a lot of that is because people work it out or they give up. Um, but what we see here is by structuring this, we can get a resolution rate almost as high as 80% of these cases by using these tools in that delay. So let me, just, let me just show you an example of what we built in Clark County. So this is Las Vegas. This is a family dispute resolution process. I guess if you're going to do divorces, Vegas is a good place to do it because so many people get married at 2 a.m. by Elvis impersonators. Um, but essentially, there is already a really great family mediation program in Clark County. And they hired 11 mediators who just work in the family mediation center. They are employees of the court. 
And all the cases that come in the door, uh, you know, they, they work them out. They do about 4,000 cases a year. And it usually takes about a month to get a resolution. And they, they settle about 70% of their cases, uh, which is pretty impressive. Now, they're very focused on the custody issue. If you want to deal with your asset divisions or spousal support, um, they urge you to get a private or a volunteer mediator. These, the people in this office are really focused on parenting plans. So the solution that we worked on was parenting plans. And we built a, a software product that works in conjunction with that office, in essence, to help put that together. So let me show you how this works. In essence, uh, they have a court, and I saw you had a, a, a testimonial in the video from the chief administrative officer of the, of the North Carolina courts. You know, a lot of what Tyler has made its money doing is providing software to courts to buy, uh, to manage their caseloads. And Tyler's product is called Odyssey, and it's a large court case management system. So every case that gets e-filed in, it goes into Odyssey, and then everything is kind of managed in this interface. But what we did in Odyssey is we created a new tab in each case um, that tracks, essentially, the resolution progress. And the, the court administrator and the judges, they don't have visibility into the ODR process. It's completely separate. Modri is separate. But we do provide real-time updates back into Odyssey that show high-level milestones on the case. Nothing substantive, but you can come in and click on this tab, and you can see what's happening in the dispute resolution process in terms of what milestones have been achieved. But essentially, the platform automatically opens up a resolution room when a case is e-filed, and then invites in, invites in the petitioner. Now, the way this works is, um, essentially, a room is created that is for creating a parenting agreement. And we break down all of the issues that be, need to be negotiated into these eight areas. You can see the icons there. So again, this is only the complainant at this point. But when they hit start, we walk them through each of these areas. It's a little bit like TurboTax, I guess. So we say, okay, legal custody. This is what legal custody means. It's deciding who's responsible for making major decisions regarding the children, including health, education, and religious upbringing. So this is the first topic. And the options that you have, the platform breaks it down. You can say, I want joint legal custody, or I want sole legal custody. And if you say you want sole legal custody, you can say who you think should have it, maybe you or your, your co-parent. And then essentially, we're only asking for the opinion of the, of the petitioner at this point. So this petitioner says joint legal custody. We say, okay, thank you very much for that selection. This is the language we're going to be putting into your parenting agreement. Do you want to proceed, or do you want to go back and make a different choice? Say, yep, this one looks good. Let's proceed. And then we walk through each of these areas, and we gather their preferences. Again, the respondent is not engaged yet. This is just getting the preferences from the petitioner. They can save their progress at any time and come back to it. Um, and, you know, maybe you want to talk about, okay, which holidays do we want? You know what? Let me talk to my mom and see if she wants Easter or Christmas. So let me save it, and then I can come back to it. So, again, there's no rush, and nobody knows what selections you're, you've made until you finish making all of them. But say you go through all of these areas, uh, the petitioner makes their selections. Well, then what we do is, oh, and the other thing is you can specify additional information, like do you want to say where the exchanges are going to happen each week or every time there's a handoff? And you could say, nah, I don't need to specify that. Or, yeah, I, I actually do want to specify that. Okay, well, then you can specify it. You can put in where that, that, um, that exchange is going to occur. But in essence, once that process is completed by the petitioner, we then reach out to the defendant or the respondent. And then they come in and they see the exact same questions as the uh, petitioner. But again, the difference here is they can see the proposal from their co-parent. So when the respondent comes in and they look at legal custody, it says, well, your co-parent has proposed joint legal custody. Do you want to accept this or do you want to propose a different arrangement? And if they click propose a different arrangement, they see the same options as the petitioner. But it, so they go through and they make their selections in all eight areas as well. And by the end of that, you can see a chart that says, these are the areas where you, you pick the same option, and these are the areas where you didn't. You still have a disagreement about what the option should be. Now, the parties have still not communicated directly. They're all going through this technology intermediated process. But that's when we invite a mediator in. And the mediator joins the case, and the first thing the mediator sees is these are the areas where agreement has already been achieved. And they can go down and click on the areas where mediation or agreement wasn't achieved, and they can see what the proposals are between the two parties. And then what happens is we open up an online collaborative workspace where the mediator can work with the parties to talk about the areas uh, where there, uh, there still are things to be negotiated. 
and the mediator has a joint discussion where they communicate with both sides, and then they have a private conversation with the plaintiff and a private conversation with the defendant. And the mediator can click between these different discussions, and it all happens asynchronously. So the reason I think why this is interesting is a lot of work happens before the mediator even engages with the case. And that's sort of where the fourth party comes in and plays that role to structure the options. And, and, and again, sometimes you can reach a resolution only on seven out of the eight areas. And the eighth area has to go in, in front of the judge. That's fine. The mediator can write up, can say, generate a settlement agreement, and the platform generates the full text of the parenting agreement based on the choices that were made. And then the parties can come in, they can review it. If they don't like it, they can say, no, no, I need more changes. And then it can be revised. And if they do like it, they can say, yep, this looks good. They can e-sign it on the platform. It automatically generates a signed copy of the agreement, and then it's e-filed back into the case. And when you go back to the court case management system, again, this is the ADR tab. You can see all of the updates around this person joined, that person joined, the mediator proposed an agreement. No substance, again, because if the case does go back to the court to be decided, you don't want to see any of the substance there because that could bias the court because they would know they'd be privy to some of that direct negotiation. But then also you can go to the home page of this case within the court case management system and you can see the full text of the agreement that was generated by the platform. So this is just one example of how this can work. And this is obviously in a court context. I mean, I will point out there are many private companies that are doing similar things in the private sector. Weavorse is probably the biggest and the oldest in terms of their national footprint, working out um, family disputes online. But there's Hello Divorce is another one that's emerged here in California. We have Bliss Divorce. Um, there's It's Over Easy from Laura Wasser, the celebrity uh, divorce attorney. And again, some of these cost $1,000 to kick off. Some of these you pay a monthly subscription of 250 bucks and you can use the platform. Other ones like Laura Wasser, I mean, to kick this off, I think it's 15K to get going. And she assigns you a private shopper to help you with your retail therapy during your divorce. So there are many different levels here. I mean, the platform that we built in Clark County is intended for people that can't afford representation at all, all the way up to white glove, you know, very fancy, you know, um, celebrity divorce attorney approaches. And then, of course, there's other platforms like Our Family Wizard and Co-Parenter. They're not for creating your parenting plan. That's actually after you get divorced. They're for post-divorce conflict management. So you use those tools to do scheduling and financial budgeting and things like that um, to manage your co-parenting relationship to ensure that disputes don't arise down the road. So that's another way to, do, to use ODR technology for dispute prevention. So let me stop there. I know I just hit you with a ton of things. Um, and let's see what you think about all of that. So, Colin, I've got a question from Amy, and she has no voice, so I'm going to speak for her. No problem. And she posted the question at the beginning of your presentation, um, asking if you could talk a little bit more about how the settlement agreement is effectuated in the ODR Modria process. And I, sure. I know you went through that a little bit, but then I, I have to follow up with that on is it boilerplate language that is inserted into like a template? And if it is, do the parties have the ability to modify the language within the boilerplate paragraphs to go back? Yeah. And I mean, I, I could show you the, 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 the accurate answer and the pithy answer is it depends. You can structure yeah. a process however you want. I mean, the courts really, I found, optimize a lot of their choices around efficiency. So they wanted to use boilerplate language because they didn't want to have to review every agreement that was generated to make sure that that language was in line with the guidelines of the law. So if you design a system where the only thing parties can do is pick from a menu and you've written all of the clauses associated with every selection item in the menu, every document that's generated at the end, you don't have to review because you know they can only pick from the language that you've created. Now, we built a system with the Dutch Legal Aid Board called the Rectvisor, which was a more in-depth process. You know, we had resolutions in the parenting plan mechanism that I showed you. You know, people worked this out in five, six days. Uh, in the Rectvisor in the Netherlands, you know, people took two or three months. And the platform helped them to draft their own uh, separation agreements, kind of like a Google Doc, you know, where they can go in and both sides can write and uh, it highlights their contributions in different colors. And they can both indicate acceptance of the terms. And then it goes to a legal reviewer 
who has to go through the document, and read everything, and make sure it's within the guidelines of the law, guardrails of the law. And if not, then they can push that back to the parties and say, you need to work on this clause a little bit more because, you know, for X, Y, and Z reason. And the parties can revise it. So I think, I think it's a dispute systems design question, fundamentally, how much control you give the parties. And I think that there are, you know, there are concerns. I know the New York State uh, court system created an ODR process. And, you know, people were saying, you know, consumers don't know what a fair resolution is. And if you, if you give them a, an open text box and say, create an agreement, they may come up with some, you know, agree to something that's, that is, you know, that cedes all of their power and all the protection they have under the law because they don't know the law. So they said, well, how can we get lawyers in there to advise them? I think there are ways that technology can help to structure the process to ensure that you don't have a system where the powerful are taking advantage of the powerless or the high information parties that have been through the process a lot and they know all of the wrinkles and all the rules. They take advantage of the people that have never gone through it before because they just don't know, you know, what a reasonable resolution is. So I think it's, it is a very interesting um, design question. Now, the other part that you asked, Tara, was um, how do you enforce these things? Now, when you look in the courts, it's pretty much the same way that, you know, a court process works. I mean, I think when you write a settlement agreement, both sides sort of sort of sign it and then they send it to the court. And the court certifies it. I think it has the same um, force as if the judge was actually to have decided the case and issued a decision. Now that you can have a decision or you can have a settlement agreement and then the other side doesn't abide by it. And then you still have to go do work to get it enforced. The thing that I like about um, eBay and Airbnb and all these sites is enforcement is built in. You know, when I decided a case at eBay and I decided somebody was entitled to a refund, I took the money from the seller and I gave it to the buyer. And even if the seller wasn't happy about that, and even if the seller's account was at zero, I could take the money from them and took, take their account negative. So if they ever made any money on that account, it would go back to paying us back for the amount that we had to pay their buyer. I think one of the top determinants of success in ODR platforms is enforceability. Uh, people say to me all the time, why don't you go build an ODR system for Craigslist? Because it's just a mess over there. And there's a lot of bad experiences where sellers are taking advantage of buyers. But the problem on Craigslist is if you buy a laptop for cash at a Starbucks, you don't know the email or the phone number of the person you're buying it from. You know, you just meet them and then you engage in the transaction and you go home and plug in that laptop and it bursts into flames. Well, kind of too bad. I mean, you can't take the money out of their pocket. You know, they could be in Tijuana. Uh, you know, five minutes later, and you don't really know their contact information. So I don't think you can build an ODR system the way Craigslist currently works. And I've consulted with them and said, if you made some changes, if you, you know, allowed, if you track the identity of people, if you created online payments, if people pay with a credit card and you have a bad experience, well, you can file a chargeback. Um, but if you pay with cash, there's no way to reverse that transaction. So I think that you do need to look at the overall environment within which you're designing an ODR system to determine whether or not enforcement is going to be a challenge. And there are some of the people who are really on the bleeding edge of online dispute resolution, they are contemplating a whole new justice system that they call decentralized justice, where it kind of works a little bit like PayPal, you know, where you're paying with virtual currencies. And, um, you know, if, if, if a case is decided against you, the, the enforcement is automatic. Um, but we may be, you know, still a decade away from something like that happening. So. I think it, I think it, we do see very high follow through, just like in face to face mediation, when people have the ability to agree to a settlement, they're much more likely to abide by it than if you have a evaluative process and then somebody says, well, that was unfair. I'm just not going to abide by that decision. There, you know, there's very little that you can do if you don't have the enforcement power behind an evaluative process. So anyway, again, it's an, another very rich discussion, but Tara, hopefully we check the box. Yeah, I think so. And then to follow up on that, are you finding that the, the program in Clark County is utilized by parties that are pro se or that have counsel or both? Yeah. I mean, is there a variation there that you can talk about? Yeah, the vast majority in Clark County are pro se. And we see in a lot of the courts that we worked with at Tyler, the crisis of pro se litigants. I mean, the vast majority of these cases are people that are not represented. And, you know, they come to the courthouse and they, what do I do? What should I file? What's my next step? And people are reluctant to tell them. I mean, they can go to the legal librarian and say, can you give me some advice? And maybe they'll kind of point them in the right direction. But, you know, pro se litigants get, get statistically significant worse outcomes than people who are represented. 
Um, and I know lawyers say, well, look, we need to get more money for legal aid so that we can pay lawyers to assist these people. But I don't know where that money is going to come from. It doesn't seem like there's, um, you know, any huge, huge increase in, in, in legal aid dollars on the horizon anywhere. So I think that's one of the reasons why PU and NCSC and, and the ABA have looked at ODR, because if you can provide some technology tools, I can show you some examples of some of the legal service websites we've built. If you combine this kind of legal education, um, litigant portal, um, triage, and these kind of ODR tools where people can use technology to try and find a, a, a resolution to their particular case, you know, I think that's an, a more navigable system for pro se litigants because they get a little more help than if they try and just navigate the court case on their own. So. so we had a great question about the cost for developing such a program. And I, I take it sure. by the way that you're speaking about the pro se litigants, that the pro se litigants do not bear the cost um, of this program. So how, how does it typically work when you implement ODR? Yeah, so still a lot of debate about how that works. I think, um, for instance, most of the profession, most of the e-commerce websites we've built, these services are, are provided for free. So it's included at eBay. Essentially, eBay covered the cost, not only for creating the program, um, but anytime somebody wanted to file a case, they could do so for free and there was never any fees paid. Now, eBay is making money on each transaction. So they sort of felt like, well, let's take a tenth of a penny off of each transaction, put it in a fund, and that'll cover the cost for resolutions. Um, I, I personally believe in, we have an organization called iCoder. I can show you more about iCoder in a minute, but it's the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution. And one of the things we say in consumer ODR systems, it's best for the consumer to not have to pay because if they feel like they've already been wronged and then they have to pay for redress, it just compounds the sense of wrong. Now, what I often said to the courts when we were designing and launching these ODR systems is they're already paying a, an e-filing fee for filing their case. So ideally, if we can cover the, whatever costs are associated with ODR from that e-filing fee, that would be great. But then the courts would say to me, well, that e-filing fee is already spoken for. You know, we already use that money to run the systems that we have. So uh, it can be a challenge, I think, for courts to figure out how these things can get paid for. I've seen some courts implement, you know, institute small fees to kick off the ODR process just because they want to make sure that the parties are participating in good faith, like they really have some skin in the game. Um, or maybe you pay extra for a mediator. Um, I know we were talking uh, before about um, uh, you know, mediators who do pro bono services and a lot of these court connected mediation programs, they may receive some money from the courts for their operations, but the individual parties don't pay for that. When I did my court connected mediations, for instance, you know, I never got paid. The parties didn't have to pay. They, it was just a, an option that they could do before they actually went in front of the magistrate to get a decision. So I think the payment models are still kind of in flux a little bit. Um, I, uh, one of the things that I wrote about in that book that I did for the ABA called the new handshake. Um, is I showed that businesses that invest in the creation of these mechanisms, they get massive rewards in terms of greater loyalty from their customers. So I can show on a cost benefit basis, based on the data of these tens of millions of people that we had in eBay and PayPal, that when you provide a fast and fair redress process, their usage of that service increases significantly, even um, you see an increase in the usage of that site or service over someone that never had a dispute in the first place. So if, if PayPal invested tens of millions of dollars in building its resolution processes, but they made hundreds of millions of dollars from increased activity from those users that went through those processes, uh, the courts don't have the same financial incentive, really. And I do have courts who say to me, look, we just don't have the money to build this right now. We just don't have the budget. And, you know, what I often do, I have a calculator that I use called the return on resolutions calculator. I say, well, how much does it cost you per case now to resolve? And oftentimes courts don't know. But if you start working it out in terms of the fees for the court administrators and how long the case is there and you say, well, you know, these cases, they cost a couple thousand dollars from filing to resolution. And if we can do it online, we can cut that cost to a couple hundred dollars. So then you're talking about, OK, if we're if we're saving that much per case then you can fund the creation of this platform with a, fragment, a fraction of that savings. But, you know, that's, it's often hard to do that. It, it feels like funny dollars. It's like future money. Well, I'm saving future money to pay for a cost that I have to add to my budget right now. So there's no easy answer. I, I have to say I have a lot of sympathy for the folks in the courts. I think it's a, it's a rock and a hard place. 
more and more pro se litigants, more and more need. You think about the eviction tsunami that's coming now in the wake of the pandemic. You know, courts were struggling to stay on top of these volumes before. Um, but what we see is actually filing volumes in the courts have been slowly declining over time. But the number of transactions is increasing. And it's because we're seeing a privatization of a lot of these redress processes. People, they don't want to file in the courts. It almost, I mean, I, I know a lot about the court system. I cannot imagine a circumstance where I would file a small claims case. You know, I would, I would do everything I could in the private sector to resolve that before I had to resort to the courts. So many judges have talked to me about what they feel is the spiral of irrelevance, that the courts are going to become less and less relevant, particularly for these low dollar value civil cases. The only options available to parties are going to be in the private sector, really feasibly available or through legal service bureaus. So, um, you know, so that's a lot of speculation about where it's going, but I think that's motivating some of the experimentation. And uh, I think that people at the top, as I say, in the bar associations and chief justices, they're saying, you know, we can't make this equation add up. We need to figure out a way to change the game and think outside the box. And maybe technology gives us some of those tools and opportunities so we can think a little bit more creatively and figure out how to get ahead of the problem as opposed to just, you know, trying to tread water. So I, I'm so curious to hear what people think about that. Yeah, we've got a great question about confidentiality. Do you have any concerns? Um, and then also, when you speak about confidentiality and the platforms that you're using for ODR, does the information within the ODR platform always transfer to the court file, or does it stay in its own platform? So, because I've kind of heard it go both sure. ways. Well, let me just, I'll use this, the confidentiality question as just a quick segue into uh, iCoder. Have worked hard to come up with uh, a set of ethical standards that can govern the, the the practice of ODR, and you know there's been years and years of scholarship about this, but we've kind of distilled it down to this set of ethical standards, and they're available on icoder.org's website. Everything's available from icoder uh, for free, but uh, in in terms of these standards, we've thought a lot about what the language is, like accessibility. You think well, it needs to be easy to access the ODR system. But there's other things too. Not only should it be easy to discover where it is, it should be transparent. It should be available. You shouldn't have to have a fancy laptop to do it. You should be able to do it on your phone. It shouldn't be too expensive because cost can be a barrier to accessibility. And also we need to think about accessibility by people with different physical ability levels, which is something that people don't often associate with accessibility. But when you think about security, we have one standard around confidentiality maintaining the confidentiality of party communications and being transparent about who will see what. Then we have another around security, which is related but slightly different. That's protecting the information so that outsiders can't come in and see it. And if there is a breach into the system, users need to be informed. And then the last one we have, um, uh, well, we often talk about privacy as another element of confidentiality. And I'll actually stop my share there because I think this is sort of a, this is a very rich topic. If you ask end users what their main concern is about resolving a dispute through an online process, they'll, the first thing they'll almost always say is confidentiality and privacy. You know, how do I know who is actually seeing this information? How do I know that this is not going to end up in a Google search in three years? And what makes me nervous is a lot of mediators out there are doing online dispute resolution, but they're using tools like email or they're using Google Docs or they're using Skype. And the problem is these are not secure channels. These tools were not built with dispute resolution in mind. Email in particular is highly insecure. If Tara, if you send me something sensitive and say, look, you know, I, I do feel bad. I, I did cause this problem, but I don't think that I should have to pay $50,000. I think that, you know, I think the estimate is $5,000. Well, you've admitted that you have some fault and I can take that email and I can send it to 500 people and you will never know. And you have no ability to, pull that information back. You don't know who that information is going to be shared with. So, um, you know, email in particular is highly insecure and mediators are using it every day with their parties. So I think we need to develop tools within the field that, that take these concerns very seriously so that we can ensure that mediators that utilize these tools are abiding by their procedural and ethical obligations. Um, and I think that's one of the things, for instance, um, Tyler, when we were building Modria, they said, well, the courts want to be able to look inside the mediations. And I had to say, no, that's not the way this works. You know, the, it has to remain separate. 
And I know the courts are paying for the software product, and they think it's weird that they would pay for a platform that they can't see inside what's happening in the platform. But the courts understood that. The court administrative officers and the judges, they understood why it needed to remain confidential. But um, Tyler themselves, that, that wasn't the way it works. I mean, they build software for the courts. Everything's kind of an open book. You know, it's all about disclosure. It's about tra providing transparency. So building a system that didn't provide that transparency was a little counterintuitive initially. But eventually they, they did understand the value of it. So I think confidentiality is a huge issue. I think it's, it gets to the core of the trust dilemma that parties feel around the use of technology. But I will say, looking at all the ODR platforms, and you can go to odr.info and click on the provider list, there's more than 100 companies that are providing ODR services. It's not just the ones that I'm talking about here today, and I, and I urge you to explore some of them. I know these companies take that confidentiality responsibility very seriously, and we at iCoder are going and certifying platforms to ensure that they live up to the ethical standards that we've articulated for ODR practice. So it's going to be an ongoing concern, definitely. But, um, you know, I think, I think it is addressable. Um, I also have courts that say, well, we run all of our stuff in-house. We have our own servers. You know, we kind of do it on site. And they say, how do we know that your cloud services are secure? And I said, well, if you look at the studies, it shows that cloud services are far more secure than on-site servers. Just because if you have a professional that's watching the servers 24-7, that's usually lots of servers, thousands of servers all at once and patching them all at once. That's usually much more secure than having somebody run a box, you know, that's connected to the internet in somebody's office because probably they're doing other things too, like making sure the printers work and then ensuring that that box is protected against all potential threats. It's a much, much bigger challenge in that respect. So anyway, it's, uh, there, it's gonna continue to evolve, but uh, confidentiality is, is, it has to be a front and center consideration for all of us. So any other good questions, Tara, that we should tackle? The only other question, I think I skipped it earlier, um, is someone is asking where a catalog of the systems you offer can be found. Sure, sure. I think the best answer to that would be at odr.info. I'll put it in the chat. Um, that's where you can see a list of all the platforms. Um, you know, I, I'm, we are building a system at mediate.com called odr.com is going to be available next year. Um, and the heart of that system is our platform, which we called Caseload Manager, uh, which is used by, I think, 100 and, 110 different dispute resolution programs around the world. So you can go check out Caseload Manager. I'd be happy to give a demo to anybody. But uh, as I say, there are other really good platforms. I think some of the ones I really like, one is called Immediation.com, another one called Modron.com. There's Resolve disputes.online, which is really good. Um, there's one called mediate2go.com. I mean, I could keep doing this all day, posting uh, really great <laughs> services, but those are all platforms that you can go check out. Oh, and I mentioned uh, there's obviously modria.com, and then there's Matterhorn. Uh, I think it's getmatterhorn. Um, but again, I, I urge you to explore and see uh, what systems there are out there. There are new ones arising all the time. These are mostly the ones in the US. Well, US, UK, and, and Australia. Um, there's another one, a great one, very cool, called smartsettle.com that's very unique. That one's based in Canada. But then there's great services. Ebram's in um, Hong Kong, they're amazing. Um, there's one called Sana in India, which is amazing. Uh, as I say, their platforms are rising all over the world. And it's, it's great to see all of the innovation. You know, my, my feeling, again, from a Silicon Valley perspective is creative destruction. Let a thousand flowers bloom, um, and then we'll see which ones succeed. Um, it, can, it can seem a little chaotic with all the innovation that's happening out there all over the place, but um, this is the way that innovation can best occur. And one of the challenges that the courts have, obviously, is the courts are not subject to the same competitive pressure. So if I don't like the services I'm getting in a small claims court, I can't say, forget it, I'm going to go to the other small claims court. And I think that lack of competitive pressure, it, it, it doesn't create the same incentive to experiment and innovate. But a lot of these companies are selling to the courts. So the courts can benefit from some of this innovation by partnering with private entities. So um, I, I like what Utah has done. I like what Connecticut has done in terms of building their own system. But the challenge is, are they going to continue to innovate? Are they going to continue to invest to keep those platforms kind of on the cutting edge? 
because the expectations citizens are bringing to those platforms are not coming from other ports. They're coming from websites like Google and Facebook and, you know, that are constantly updating their services. So let me just show a couple closing slides here and then, uh, and then we can wrap it. So we talked about iCoder standards. I'll share all of this with Tara, so, with you, Tara, so you can uh, share it with people because uh, we're not going to talk about all of these things. But the idea of people coming in and explaining their case and having sort of a uh, machine learning algorithm go out and look at millions of similar cases and come back and say, you know, here's a heat map of kind of where it's likely that the resolution will occur. We're seeing a lot of sites. There's a company out here in San Francisco called Do Not Pay. And you can go in, if you get a parking ticket or there's a case against you, you can come in and give them a lot of information and then they will go essentially fight the case on your behalf and come back and say, hey, we got a settlement of this. Do you, you, know, do you accept that? No, I don't, go fight some more. Um, so this is an interesting agent based. This is another one in Chicago that's using technology to sort of advocate on behalf of tenants. And it'll write letters for them. Um, it'll, you know, based on the information submitted to kind of help people stay in their houses. Um, but, but the last thing that I just want to plant the seed of is, again, everything I'm showing you today, it, it may seem, wow, this is kind of cool. This is kind of interesting. But it's, it's all about where this is going. And when I talk to young people, you know, people, um, I teach it at, at Stanford Law School. I'm teaching there tonight. I teach at Pepperdine. I teach at Santa Clara. You know, the younger generation, they're trying to think, you know, step function. How can we evolve this? Um, you know, Richard Susskind, who's the chief IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice in the UK, he wrote a book called Online Courts and the Future of Justice. And he says in that book, 50% of people on the planet don't have access to a justice system. And there's really no way to expand access meaningfully to that 50% if we continue to do things the way we've always done them. So this whole notion of decentralized justice where software sort of becomes the law. I, I think what we're going to see is kind of a parallel justice system emerge on the internet to deal with these kinds of cases that the, the legacy justice system can't really handle that well. It doesn't mean the legacy justice system is going to go away, not at all. There's always the high dollar value, billion dollar litigation, IP litigation, whatever. You know, if you can get a white shoe law firm to fight for you, you can get justice out of the courts and, I, and it's absolutely top quality. The challenge is, as you say, these pro se litigants, they don't understand the system. They can't navigate it. They have high volume, low value cases. So by utilizing some of these new tools, and if you think about how fast the internet's gonna get, how powerful computer processors are gonna get, I think there's a vision for a, a next justice system. And I think some of these ODR tools are on that path to this vision. A lot of the stuff I'm talking about in terms of ODR, when I first started writing about this in 2000, 2001, it sounded like George Jetson. Like, like, this is never going to happen. This is such crazy futurist stuff. And, and people would pat me on the shoulder at conferences and say, wow, this is really, really interesting what you're doing. But that's, that's not going to happen. And now it's commonplace. All these things are happening every day. I would say more mediations are occurring online now than are occurring face to face. So again, we have to think about what direction arrows are headed. And if computers get powerful enough to provide meaningful uh, research and analysis, you know, we may rely on them to value our cases and give us advice about resolution options. And people may end up trusting computers in resolving some of these cases more than they would trust a human to play the same role. Just like we're going to have computers driving our cars in 20 years, it may be we'll have computers running our justice system. But there are going to be more people working in the justice system in 20 years than there are today. Just like the financial system. Many jobs were eliminated. There's nobody standing on the floor of the stock exchange saying, who wants to buy 1,000 shares of IBM? Those jobs are all gone. But now those people are programming the computers that are doing those trades in milliseconds. That's what's going to happen in the justice sector. You're going to have a lot of people sitting in cubes writing software, and we're going to be delivering more justice, higher quality justice, more transparency to more people around the world. And hopefully we're going to 10x the volume of cases that are getting resolved in a fast and fair manner through the use of these tools. But if you, resist the, if you resist this and say, I don't like it, I don't want to do it, I'm going to fight against it, you're shaking your fist as the rainstorm comes over you. And I think there are opportunities here for us to take these tools and build a better system. Um, but, you know, if, if you insist on doing things the old way, that's a shrinking pot. Uh, that's my advice. So um, I, I don't want to make it seem like it's a threat. I think there's more of an opportunity here than there is um, a threat. But I think... Um, 
hopefully, hopefully uh, you'll find it, everyone will find a corner of this work where they can carve it out and they can build a system. I mean, I love we were just talking about ODR for pet disputes. Let's do it. Let's build it. I mean, there's a lot of those cases out there, and I don't think they're getting handled very well through the courts, so we can do a better job. So, um, okay, any other uh, comments, questions, thoughts, reactions? I see some lovely comments in the, in the chat. Thank you for your I've got a question about what about blockchain? Ooh, we got one minute. Um, no, I, I love blockchain. I think blockchain is very cool. I don't know if anybody has spent any time buying and selling Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or some of these virtual currencies. Blockchain really is a global distributed ledger. And when you put something in the blockchain, it can't be changed because it's copied so many different places. So this is a very powerful trust technology. Tara, if you and I have an agreement and we can write it up as a smart contract and we e-sign it and we put it on the blockchain, it cannot be edited. And that's different than if I send you a Word doc, you know, or you send me a Word doc and it's on my hard drive. I could change it. Who knows? Where's the definitive copy? We got a bunch of different versions lying around. So the, the blockchain is a core trust technology in virtual currencies, and I think it is now emerging as a core trust technology in decentralized justice. So it may be that you know, the blockchain is, is going to be a, a, something we all rely on, and it's, it's commonplace in, in 20 years. But right now, there's a lot of experimentation with how to integrate blockchain into the justice system. So great question, Wade. All okay. right. I could go I on, but I've questions. used my 90. So thank you, Tara, so much for the invite. Thanks for the great questions, everyone. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Visit us at mediate.com. Visit us at arbitrate.com. And uh, ADR Cyber Week is coming up the first week of um, November. Free conference, uh, global conference. So go check it out at odr.info, and uh, we'd love to have you at any, any or all of those sessions. Colin, we appreciate you taking your time today. We really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so, so much. You betcha. Next time I'm coming to North Carolina. Yes, absolutely. That Great. sounds Take wonderful. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Talk to you soon.